This is our Sunday School Lesson, Lesson 8 from Unit 2 for October the 22nd, 2017. It is from our studies of Called into Covenant with God and this Sunday's title is A Much Bigger Plan. Our devotional reading is Psalm number 89 verses 1 through 15. Our background scripture is 2 Samuel, the 7th chapter, verses 1 through 16, Psalm 89, and also 1 Chronicles, the 22nd chapter, verses 6 through 8. Our printed passage is 2 Samuel, the 7th chapter, verses 1 through 6, 6, uh, 8 through 10, and 12 through 16. Our key verse is from the NIV, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Our lesson's aims are analyze David's desire and the Lord's promise. Confess your natural human limitations in, att in attempting to serve God in a manner that is worthy of the eternal and omnipresent Creator. And then humbly accept God's blessings rather than striving to earn them through impressive acts of service. Our, our lesson's heading reads, Good Intentions versus God's Will. Good Intentions versus God's Will. And the uh, first five verses opens up by speaking of David, the king over Israel who had been appointed as the ruler over Israel by God. And we remember the story that David was attending the sheep. He was a young shepherd. And in 2 Samuel here, it starts out by saying, and it came to pass. And in the NIV it says, after the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him. So it places us in the uh, state of mind that David was in. Uh, as we read the preceding chapters uh, in the sixth uh, chapter of Second Samuel uh, and the fifth chapter, we realize that David had just come out of war with the uh, Philistines and God had blessed him and he was victorious. And it speaks of that uh, when the Lord had given him rest, uh, the rest was freedom from the worries of his enemies around him, uh, worries from the unsettlement uh, in his spirit, wondering about who was trying to attack him, who was strategizing on attacking Israel and the nation that God had placed him as ruler over. God had entered him into rest and freed him from these concerns. And while he was in his palace and settled, uh, he sent for Nathan the prophet and he explained his desires, the desires of his heart, that here I am living in this house of cedar, this palace, and while the ark of God remains in a tent. 
And uh, Nathan replied to the king because he began to read into what uh, David was setting up, that David was making a comparison that I'm dwelling in luxury, yet the word of our God is in a tent. I don't think that that's that's. Uh, equal. I don't. I, I don't think that. Not that we could ever be equal to God, but I don't think that I should be adorned with uh, all of this fineness and luxuries and such. And yet we have the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of our God in word form. We have this in a tent, and so Nathan understood the uh, spirit that David was speaking in, and he says to him, uh, whatever you have in your mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But yet, the Lord was with David, but he did not develop, nor did he send this desire that David had concocted in his own mind. And so then, since Nathan gave David the agreement, since Nathan gave David the approval and encouraged David and said to him, hey, whatever you have in your mind, just go ahead and do it because the Lord is with you. The Lord is on your side. Brother, you got this. Go ahead and whatever it is, it's going to be blessed. But then the Lord went to Nathan because Nathan was the one who encouraged it. And he told Nathan, now you go back and you tell David that this is what I said, not what you said, but this is what I said. And it says, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? And then he reminds him, I haven't dwelt in a house since the day that I brought your people, since I brought the Israelites out of Egypt to this very day. I've been moving from place to place with the tent as my dwelling. Now, we know that God is omnipresent, that the spirit of God is present everywhere at the same time, all over. But the presence of God guided the Israelites, the Hebrews, out of their bondage in Egypt and led them by a cloud through the wilderness of Mount Sinai as though he was leading the people through the wilderness, presence being manifested in a cloud. Uh, and so uh, they were tent dwelling and they established a certain corridor in the tent dwelling for the covenant of the Lord where they would worship and honor God. And so as we look at this, we see, uh, okay, these are some of the dynamics that are playing into what is leading David to be overcome to say the things that David is saying. Now, now we know that David had good intentions. Uh, we don't uh, suspect or read into the text that uh, David was uh, trying to impress God or that uh, David was performing uh, or suggesting this uh, task or this own taking to prepare a dwelling for Almighty God. Uh, we don't read into this that uh, David is using this in some form of manipulation. But to help us to better see what has overcome David and in his quest uh, to show some form of appreciation unto God, we also need to look at what preceded this. After 
God had allowed David to be victorious over the Philistines with some uh, 30,000 warriors or men in battle. Then uh, we notice that uh, David is in uh, Baal, Bella, Judah, and he wants to move the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And uh, this is in the sixth chapter of Second Samuel. And if we read through uh, the beginning of that, uh, we find that he was supposed to move it a certain way. But then he decided to use a uh, more convenient means. And, and the beginning of the sixth chapter of Second Samuel, it tells us that a man by the name of Uzzah had a new cart. And that he brought the cart and David and some of the men, they lifted the Ark of the Covenant into the new cart and they began to move it and it came from a hill and as it was coming uh, across the uh, threshing floor, um, Elza put his hand onto the Ark of God and this is in the sixth verse of the sixth chapter of Second Samuel. And of course, when he did that, it uh, caused a disruption. Uh, the scripture tells us that the oxen stumbled and uh, that the cart was, was struck and uh, it uh, aroused anger in the Lord and Uzzah, who was not to touch, this was set aside for the Levites, for the priests to handle the Ark of the Covenant. But in the excitement of being victorious in one end, we can never lose sight of getting so caught up into the blessings of God that we disregard the order of God. So as they were moving the cart, not in accordance with the uh, guidelines that God had set for how the cart was to be moved. Once they saw what happened to Uzzah, David was struck with fear. He, you should just read all the way down through uh, the sixth chapter of uh, 2 Samuel. David was struck with fear and he chose to leave the Ark of the Covenant and it was taken to a house uh, with a Gittite by the name of Obed-Edom. And uh, he was a man that was living in the area at the time and he kept the Ark of the Covenant for three months. So during that time that David was fearful of the fact that he didn't even want to touch it because he saw it took the life of Uzziah. And so he didn't want to, he feared the Lord. He, he had, now he had reverence for the power of Almighty God. And so he did not want to come into conflict with the displeasure that God displayed. So he removed himself from the cart because he didn't want whatever chastisement or punishment was due him. But later, some of his people came and told him that the house of Obed-Edom and his family, his household, that they had been blessed and that the household of Obed-Edom, that they, his whole household was being full and abundantly blessed. Now, David realizes that uh, the Ark of the Covenant that I was so fearful of, 
that I uh, neglected the responsibility of, that I ran from, possessed the power to bless and to bless abundantly. And wouldn't we think that David already knew that since the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant was with him and that he had already been blessed on numerous occasions prior to him wanting to withdraw and move himself away from the Ark of the Covenant. But let's personalize it. But isn't that how we are sometimes in life? Uh, We do something wrong. God gets our attention by letting us know that God is displeased with our action. We did something uh, out of step, out of order. And then we see the presence of God and his disapproval. And then we become fearful and we run from God. We withdraw from God, but we realize that God is a benevolent God. God is a loving God. Sometimes love, especially in this day and time, we recognize that when you love someone, you chastise them to keep them in the path of righteousness. And so he was not going to destroy David, but sometimes we remove ourselves fearful of the fact that, uh, God may take my life. Um, so, uh, here, what we realize is, is that as you read further, that David found out that Obad Edom whole household and himself were being blessed. Then he says, I think I'm going to go back and get that blessing. I think I'm going to go back and get the Ark of the Covenant because if it will do that to a stranger, if it will do that for someone that uh, is not in direct relationship with the Lord, but that I am, then I know that I can receive that blessing also. And then when they retrieve the Ark of the Covenant, David began to dance and he danced mightily in the presence of the Lord. And then it tells us that he also began to uh, present uh, offerings to the Lord. He gave a uh, burnt offering to the Lord. He gave a peace offering to the Lord. And a lot of times when burnt offerings are brought before the Lord, they are to uh, make an atonement for a certain act that we performed. And then the peace offering is to once again to regain relationship, to establish and renew our relationship with the Lord, to repent of our wrong and then return to the Lord. So these these are the events that took place preceding the seventh chapter. Now, as we move further to verses eight and 10, then we see the unexpected promise. And although David, after he danced before the Lord and made an amends for his wrongdoing, uh, and then in his heart, had chosen to prepare a house for God, here's what the promise, the unexpected promise that he was not uh, aware of. But here's what God says to him. He says, now then, tell my servant, this is what the Lord Almighty says, I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone. I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning. Now, isn't that an assurance 
Now, now that's uh, that's a real promise. Uh, one of the things as we continue to look at the covenants that God has made uh, with the different periods throughout biblical history and the characters, uh, David, uh, with Moses, uh, with Abraham, with Noah. So as we look at these promises, we recognize that God always fulfills his end of the bargain. Covenant is a contract. It's an agreement. But God always fulfills his part of the agreement. The only question is, is the other party that is engaged in the covenant, in the agreement, in the contract, do we fulfill our part? Here he's still speaking to Nathan as to what he is instructed to tell his servant David. But he wants to remind David of what he has already done. He wants to let David know that when you thought you were just going to be a shepherd, that you were going to follow the footsteps of those before you, your immediate uh, family, your siblings, when, when you felt that your destiny was known, I selected you. I had another plan for your life. And I appointed you as the ruler over my people. And I have been with you ever since I appointed you. I haven't neglected you. I haven't uh, removed my presence from you. I haven't withdrawn. I have been with you and been victorious in and through you, for you, and for the salvation and for the, the, the promise that I've made to you and my people. And I have always fulfilled my promise. So now he says, I want you to let him know that I'm going to provide. He doesn't need to provide a place for me. But I'm going to provide a place for him and for Israel. And I'm going to plant them in a area, in a dwelling that they will have as their own. And no wicked people will oppress them anymore. Now, as we come to the last part of our lesson, I want to just read uh one of the thing about uh, our desire uh, to make a impressive dwelling for God. Isaiah, the 66th chapter and the first verse says this. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool where is the house that you will build for me and where is the place of my rest now that that encapsulizes the whole awesomeness and the enormity of God, which is beyond the word enormity itself, unlimited. We can't even phantom the majesty that God possesses. But that just centers it in into simple, but very, very explicit, and just voluminous expressions for 
it makes the comparison that the heaven which we cannot see is my throne the earth is my footstool and it ends by saying and where is the place of my rest for the one who doesn't sleep and doesn't slumber now as we close our lesson verses 12 through 16 and it says when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors speaking to David now I will raise up your offspring to su succeed you your own flesh and blood I will establish his kingdom he is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever and I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod welded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me, your throne will be established forever. Now, the commentary has suggested that uh, there are some overlays here speaking of the temple that Solomon built. In fact, one of our background scriptures, First Chronicles uh, 22, verses 6 and 8, David is actually talking to Solomon about the building of the house of God. And we know that uh, the house that the temple that Solomon uh, built, uh, it was so awesome. It was such a luxurious palace. It was so great that uh, even in the book of Zephaniah, in the fourth chapter, uh, it talks about and who would despise the day of small things because the people's heart became weary when they reflected upon the temple of Solomon and then look at the temple they were building from small things compared to the grandeur that they reflected on from days gone by. But here, we are not just talking about the temple through the immediate lineage of David. No, the promise was far-reaching, far beyond that. And as we look at a familiar passage out of the uh, 7th chapter of Isaiah. Actually, it is Isaiah. It's a familiar passage and we hear it uh, at Christmas all the time. And so I just wanted uh, to leave bit by reading from this uh, comparison leading up to what the text is actually speaking of speaking beyond what we uh, have associated with on Solomon and David speaking to him about the temple, more so to the spiritual temple that the wording of, of the scripture in the text was speaking to. Now this, uh, I apologize, it was Isaiah the ninth chapter and I will begin it at the sixth verse and we will see how it overlays and ties right in to the text and it says for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and here in the 14th verse this is God speaking he says I will be his father 
and he will be my son. And it says, and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful, Consular, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, there are some definite parallels there, speaking of from the throne of David and how he will establish the kingdom. He will order it. He will establish it with judgment and justice and of his government and his increase, there will be no end. Now, I know some are saying, but the scripture also says that he would punish him. And I want to close with the relationship of the floggings being inflicted by human hands upon him. Isaiah 53 and 4 reads. Let's start at 53 and 3. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. And he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as sheep before its shearer. He was silent. He opened not his mouth. The word in verse 14 and 15 and 16 of our lesson is fulfilled in the ninth chapter of Isaiah, starting with unto us a child is born and then again lifted in Isaiah the 53rd chapter, beginning at the third verse, all the way through the seventh. I hope that something that has been shared with you in this lesson has provided some thought provoking issues and concerns that will help us and guide us and direct us on the path that Almighty God has chosen, not just for David, but also for us. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.